Hey everyone, before we delve into the stories, I need to issue a warning about the third story, which involves sexual assault. It's quite dark, so consider this a heads up in case you want to skip it. I'll label the story in the timestamps for easy navigation. And as always, feel free to send any stories you have to southerncanal.com. Without further ado, let's get started. Remember, always stay hungry. A year ago, I was preparing for my out-of-state wedding. We decided to have the legal ceremony in our hometown to avoid the hassle with the county clerk for a marriage license elsewhere. Tragically, my friend, who was supposed to officiate, committed suicide a week before this ceremony. In a last-minute change, I asked another friend to step in. We kept it intimate, inviting only our parents and my maid of honor, who officiated in a park. My other bridesmaid was infuriated about not being invited. On the day of my legal ceremony, she showed up at our apartment and vandalized the front. She destroyed decorations, cut up the wedding jewelry she was supposed to hold for me, and even slashed one of my dresses along with her own bridesmaid dress. The ceremony lasted only 10 minutes, and she was scheduled to be in the big wedding the following week. After a few weeks of silence, post-celebration, things escalated. She emailed my mom, which is odd, considering I'm in my 30s. The email was filled with vile remarks about me and my husband. She didn't stop there. She created three TikTok profiles to stalk me, made a video about me, reached out to my sister with lies, and texted several of my friends. She threatened to damage my car and claimed to have an agenda against me. She even tried to sabotage my husband's best friend's marriage and my best friend's family sending deceitful messages to my best friend's husband. Considering my friend has five kids, her actions were particularly appalling. What's shocking is that this woman is a doctor in her mid to late thirties. She once told me that I deserved to struggle after my friend's death and that I could rot in hell. She even posted false Google reviews about me, which I eventually managed to bury. Ultimately, I obtained a restraining order due to her property destruction and harassment. Fearing for her career, she agreed to a six-month consent order of protection. I could have pursued a full order but chose not to. She compensated for the tree she destroyed, sending a check with closure written in the memo, accompanied by a childlike smiley face drawing. Had I been less lenient, she could have lost her medical license. This level of insanity is unprecedented in my life. Aside from an incident where she verbally provoked someone to the extent that they chased us with their car, nearly causing a fatal accident. She's a listener of your channel. So hey, girly pop, I hope you've learned to stop spreading hate when things don't go your way. For now, she has left me in peace. And hesitate to go back to the courts and refile if she decides to act irrationally again. Stay safe, everyone. Remember, not all friends are true friends. The story really begins when I was four years old. Although I'm now a 22-year-old woman, my family moved to a new neighborhood where I met a girl, let's call her Ally, we were the same age, even sharing a birthday, and we instantly connected. I spent a lot of time at her house and even joined her family on vacations. However, things were odd. Her parents often made me pay for outings like dinners and hotel stays. As a young kid, I didn't think much of it, but my parents did, as they were footing the bills. Around age 12, Allie's mom started engaging in sketchy activities. Eventually, my parents forbade me from seeing Ally. We lost touch, but reconnected at 16, though it didn't last long. We met again at 19, right before the pandemic, 
and started hanging out with her dubious friends, often smoking, drinking, and crashing on couches. Allie confessed she had fallen for one of these guys, Jack, who didn't reciprocate her feelings. Despite my advice against it, Allie decided to cast a love spell on Jack. I, somewhat reluctantly, helped her gather supplies for a love jar. Jack found out and was understandably disturbed. I apologized for my part, but Allie denied everything, pinning it all on me. Our friendship deteriorated as she began spreading malicious rumors about our group. One of us even lost a job because of her lies. We confronted her, but she wasn't home. Her mother cursed at us, and we revealed Allie's drug use and thefts. Her mother responded by calling the police on us. Later, Allie tried to reconcile by inviting me to her car, but instead of talking, she locked the doors, sped off, and began a tirade, accusing me of betrayal. I remained calm and repeatedly asked her to let me out, but she refused. I called my mom and put her on speaker. Allie was threatened with police involvement and finally let me out. This incident marked the end of our friendship. I realized some people, no matter how long you've known them, can harbor darkness within them. It's a lesson in choosing friends wisely and recognizing when to walk away from toxic relationships. After the car incident, Allie's actions escalated alarmingly. One day, while driving to the store, I noticed a strange chemical smell from my mask, which made me dizzy and disoriented. Quickly removing it, I called my mom. That's when I discovered a hole burned into my leather seat and realized my sunroof had been broken into. From that day, I thankfully never heard from Allie again. However, the other guys eventually stopped talking to me as I headed off to college. This was just a glimpse into the havoc wreaked by my former best friend. I was naive, raised to be wary of strangers and to never reveal personal information. My parents prepared me for danger, but not the kind I encountered in this story. This wasn't anyone's fault, but the monsters I'm about to describe. In high school, I befriended a girl in my year, whom I'll call Val. Despite warnings from others, I was drawn to her. She was loud and a bit rough, contrasting with my quiet, reserved nature. Initially, she seemed kind and went out of her way to earn my trust. We became best friends quickly, and I found myself drifting away from other friendships, not realizing that she was intentionally creating this distance. I noticed Val telling lies, which I naively thought were attempts to impress me. Our friendship lasted about a year, during which time we often stayed over at each other's homes. One night, we slept in my living room. Leading up to this, there had been drama. Val had been mean, cold, and at times physically inappropriate, disguising her actions as jokes. She would hit or kick me without leaving visible bruises, dismissing it as playful and accusing me of being too uptight. Looking back, I regret not recognizing these red flags. At the time, I was too naive to anticipate anything worse. Val would sometimes guilt trip me, using threats to manipulate me. It's hard not to view my past self as foolish, especially knowing I wouldn't tolerate such behavior now. Val's behavior became increasingly alarming. She once threatened self-harm and even sent me photos of her injured arms after an argument. I can't recall every detail, but one night, her actions deeply shocked me. We were sleeping in the living room. I was on the floor and Val was on the sofa. After a rude comment and my confrontation, she made a disturbing threat. I felt frozen and vulnerable, unable to respond. She had effectively threatened to assault me. That night, I was too scared to fall asleep near her. 
once I was sure she was asleep, I quietly moved to my bedroom and dressed in jeans, a t-shirt, and a hoodie, seeking some sense of security. I was too frightened she might attempt something while I slept. In the morning, my parents questioned why I was dressed so early, but I couldn't bring myself to tell them the truth. Val noticed I had left the living room, but I avoided discussing her earlier threat. I felt uneasy, but didn't know how to address what she had said. Time passed, and her toxic behavior persisted, being mean, violent, and continuing to inappropriately touch me. I didn't tell anyone, partly because we were both females, and I didn't know how to handle such a situation. If it had been a boy, perhaps I would have understood it as clear misconduct. Reflecting on these events, I realize how challenging it can be to recognize and respond to abuse, especially when it comes from someone you consider a friend. It's a harsh reminder that danger can come from those close to us, not just strangers. The situation with Val continued to escalate, her behavior fluctuating between normalcy and manipulation. This inconsistency made it difficult for me to discern her true intentions. As a girl of my age and a friend, I found myself unsure how to react or seek help. It was a gradual escalation, making it even harder to recognize the severity of what was happening. The turning point came during a visit to her house. We were in her bedroom. She was busy with her laptop, and I sat in the middle of the bed. Without warning, the situation escalated dramatically. Val sexually assaulted me. It was a moment of profound violation and betrayal. I was frozen, fixated on an object in the room, trying to dissociate from the horror of the experience. After it ended, Val reacted as if nothing significant had happened, leaving me feeling empty and utterly confused. I couldn't process what she had done. In a state of shock, I managed to leave her house and walk home, but I felt detached, as if observing myself from outside. That night, I lay in bed, unable to sleep, staring at the light filtering through my curtains. The experience left me feeling broken and haunted. It was a stark, painful realization of how deep and damaging betrayal can be, especially when it comes from someone you once trusted. The process of healing from the trauma inflicted by Val was a slow and complex journey. As I started to confide in more people, I gradually began to see the situation from a different perspective. Their reactions, a mix of shock, anger, and empathy, helped me understand the gravity of what I had endured. It wasn't just a series of unfortunate events. It was a clear case of emotional and physical abuse. Opening up about my experiences brought a range of emotions to the surface. There was relief in finally being heard, but also a resurgence of the pain and fear I had suppressed. I had to confront the reality of the abuse, which was both liberating and terrifying. It was a crucial step in reclaiming my sense of self and agency. The support I received was instrumental in my healing. Friends and loved ones provided a safe space for me to express my feelings without judgment. They helped me realize that what happened was not my fault, and that Val's actions were a reflection of her issues, not mine. This understanding was vital in alleviating the self-blame I had carried. I also sought professional help, which provided me with tools to cope with the trauma. Therapy was a safe haven where I could unravel my thoughts and emotions under the guidance of a trained professional. It was here that I learned the importance of setting boundaries and the value of self-care. 
as I navigated this path of recovery, I discovered a newfound strength within myself. I learned to trust my intuition and to recognize the signs of unhealthy relationships. I became more assertive in protecting my well-being and more confident in my ability to overcome adversity. This experience has transformed me in ways I never expected. It has made me more empathetic towards others who have faced similar situations. It has also inspired me to be an advocate for awareness about relationship abuse, especially among teenagers who might be in similar situations as I was. Looking back, I see how far I've come from those dark days. The journey hasn't been easy, and there are still moments of struggle, but each step forward is a testament to my resilience. I am no longer defined by what happened to me, but by how I rose from it, stronger, wiser, and more compassionate. The call I made to the helpline remains the most challenging one I've ever had to make. I had hoped for support and understanding, but the response I received was far from what I needed. The woman on the other end, initially warm and reassuring, changed her tone drastically after I described the bedroom assault by Val. Her question about the validity of my experience immediately made me doubt her belief in my story. Her silence following my confirmation only intensified my discomfort. Then came her remarks about experimentation between girls, implying that what had happened was normal and dismissing the gravity of the assault. I was stunned. Her job was to provide support to victims of sexual abuse. Yet here she was, trivializing my experience and veering off into assumptions about sexual orientation. The suggestion that it was harmless experimentation was the final straw, leading me to abruptly end the call. Her response left me feeling deeply hurt and invalidated. The incident with Val was far from harmless and it was unsettling how the helpline representative failed to recognize this. Her insensitivity made me question my feelings, wondering if I was overreacting or misinterpreting the events. It was a setback in my journey to healing, pushing me back into a state of doubt and self-blame. It wasn't until I reached my 20s that I fully processed the impact of that conversation and the events with Val. I realized that the helpline's response was not a reflection of my experience's validity, but rather a failure on their part to provide appropriate support. I learned that healing is not a linear process and that seeking help can sometimes lead to unexpected outcomes. However, this experience also taught me the importance of perseverance in the face of adversity and the value of finding the right kind of support. As I continued to heal, I became more determined to advocate for better awareness and understanding of sexual abuse, especially in contexts that are often misunderstood or dismissed. My experience, while painful, has propelled me to help others who might find themselves in similar situations ensuring they receive the empathy, belief, and support they deserve. It wasn't until my 20s that I allowed myself the space to truly grieve what had happened. For years, I had repressed my emotions, minimizing the trauma to cope. The moment I finally shared my experience with my best friend and a close family member marked the beginning of a new chapter in my healing process. Their reactions were validating. They recognized the gravity of what had happened and reassured me that the helpline's response was unacceptable. Their support was a beacon of hope in a journey that had often felt isolating. Sharing my story publicly is daunting, but I do so with the intention of reaching out to others who might have faced similar experiences. Abuse can occur in various forms and between any genders, 
and it's important to recognize that. Teenagers can be perpetrators of abuse, and females can be abusive towards other females. Trusting your instincts when someone makes you feel uncomfortable is crucial. To anyone who might relate to my story, know that you are not alone. Your experiences and feelings are valid, even if they are not always understood by others. It's essential to find a support system that believes you and helps you navigate through the healing process. My journey towards healing has been a testament to resilience and the power of support. By sharing my experiences, I hope to contribute to a greater understanding and awareness of these issues. It's important to have conversations about abuse in all its forms, to educate, and to ensure that everyone feels heard, believed, and supported. In sharing my story, if I can provide solace or encourage even one person to seek the help they need, then my efforts will have been worthwhile. Healing from abuse is a journey with many challenges, but it is possible, and you deserve a life free from fear and harm. Growing up, I was aware that girls could be abusive towards boys, but I never expected to face abuse from another girl. This aspect of abuse isn't commonly discussed in society, which made it harder for me to recognize and understand what was happening to me. It's important to remember that it's never your fault if someone violates your boundaries. Consent is crucial in any interaction, regardless of the genders involved. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel dismissed or unheard after speaking out about abuse, don't let the pain stay locked inside. It's vital to find the courage to speak up again. The world can indeed be frightening, but remember, you are not alone in your struggles. There are people who will understand and support you. Stay safe, everyone, and hold on to the knowledge that any form of abuse is never your fault. You deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. That's all for today's stories. If you have your own story that you would like to share, feel free to send it to southerncannibal.com comma or you can email it to hi at gmail.com. I look forward to reading and sharing your stories. Whether it's night or day where you are, I hope you have a good one. And always remember to stay hungry for more stories, for understanding, and for the truth.